I greet you with these words of Scripture. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, happy Easter. I got to say it again. Christ is risen. Indeed he is. I think I've said happy Easter more times today than any other day, maybe combined, even in my life to all of you. And it's a joy. It's a treat. I have been looking forward to this day for more than 40 days. That's for sure. This whole year long. Looking forward. It's the highlight of the year for me. But as we begin the message this morning, I'd like us to go back to that first Easter Sunday to the early morning hours. The early morning hours when the disciples of Jesus woke up to an Easter Sunday different than you and I did. For them, they didn't know Christ had risen. In those early morning hours, when those disciples wake up, they're probably shocked as they remember their master's dead. They'd seen him crucified, executed. He died. He was buried. A stone was rolled in front of his tomb. And I'd like us this morning to travel back and try to get into the the minds and the hearts of those disciples that first Easter Sunday so that the meaning and and impact of Easter today for you can take hold of your heart and mind. In the early hours of that first Easter Sunday for the disciples of Christ, all hope is gone. Jesus has died, buried, and with him, the world of his disciples is shattered, and their hopes and dreams are laid to rest as well. And not only that, his closest followers are now living in fear for their own lives. Might they be next? Jesus, their master, the miracle worker, the Messiah, the promised one, had been butchered in front of them, murdered before their eyes. And for them, he had been everything. And, and for they, I mean, they had given up everything for him. They had left their jobs, their homes, but now without their master, they had nothing. Nothing. And, and they didn't know where to go or what to do. Jesus' disciples that first Easter Sunday woke up without hope, hopeless. And I don't know if there's a worse feeling for someone to wake up with than to think their life is hopeless. Hope, all gone, vanished, evaporated. A doctor meets with a couple he's come to know all too well. And for all involved, they've met far too many times. The couple is hoping to hear good news from the doctor But the doctor, as he shuffles his feet toward them, can only lower his eyes and say, I'm sorry, there is no effective treatment. Your wife's condition is terminal. And for this weary and wounded couple, all hope vanishes. A woman weeps uncontrollably, hunched hunched over the counter, table in her house as her husband has just walked out the door, leaving his wife of 10 years and two children, now wounded, wondering what just happened. And their world has just been decimated by his abandonment, and all dreams of a happy home have evaporated. And all that remains for them is this thick cloud of hopelessness. Hopelessness. And maybe that's a feeling that far too many of you are familiar with. Holding a phone that's still beeping after being hung up on by a straying child. Looking through the finances, it just doesn't add up. There seems to be no way out. A lonely, solitary figure eating a meal at a kitchen table with no one to share the meal with once again. 
standing in front of a casket, it finally hits you. You will never hear their voice or feel their embrace again. And friends, it's death more than anything that can bring hopelessness. And for Jesus' disciples and followers, death has brought its darkness and their hope is gone. If you have experienced hopelessness, then you can know full well how Mary Magdalene, in our gospel text today, how Mary Magdalene feels as she makes her way to that tomb on that Sunday morning. She goes very early in the morning. Any of you uh, early risers, did you see the, the moon this morning early? Stunning. What if that was the kind of moon and ambiance that Mary Magdalene shuffled toward that tomb under? Or, or maybe it was a cloud-covered moon in a dark sky. I'm sure it felt that way for her. She's out there traveling to the tomb, probably between three or six in the morning, to an anoint and embalm the body of her Lord. It's a process that, had, that didn't happen after he died. It had to wait a whole day because of the Sabbath day of rest that the Jewish law required. And among the oils and the herbs that she brought was probably some myrrh. Is one of the gifts given to Jesus 33 years earlier to, met to honor a king as a gift. I was given the gift of some essential oils not long ago, and among them was myrrh. And this smell, I, I don't know if I'd cook with it, but I mean, it's um, the smell of myrrh. You know, once upon a time, it was the smell of joy and hope at the birth of a newborn son. And now for Mary, it's embalming fluid to anoint the body of her master. Myrrh is now a smell of defeat and hopelessness at his death. And as Mary travels the vacant, dark streets to his tomb, <clears throat> I mean, she, Imagine the ache that she had inside of her. Because for her, Jesus had been everything. Everything. Before Mary met Jesus, her life was in ruins. The Bible tells us that she was possessed by seven evil spirits. And her family and friends, no doubt, would have given up on her. She had probably alienated anyone and everyone who tried to help her. She was a prisoner in her own body, and there was no getting out. And she had given up all hope, hopeless, until one day she meets a man, and this man speaks her name, and her life is changed from that point onward. When he talked to her, she felt something she hadn't felt in a long time, and that feeling was hope. Jesus had freed her, delivered her from those seven demons, from all that bound her, and from that day on, as a liberated and freed and redeemed woman, she had been a constant follower of Christ. She was by his side, even till the end. When most of his followers had abandoned him, she remained with him. She was even with Mary, Jesus' mother, at the foot of Christ's cross. And so, on this Sunday morning, it's still dark when she arrives at the tomb. And through her tear-filled eyes, she sees the, the stone has been rolled away. And she immediately assumes the worst, that his body's been stolen. And who knows what's been done to it. I mean, even for Mary, even in her grief, it's violated. How could they do this? So we're going to read now, right where we pick this up, right where I've brought you to in our gospel text from John chapter 20. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of today's gospel text. John 20, verses 11 through 18. 
Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I do not know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. It's been said that there is perhaps no sweeter sound to someone's ear than that of their own name. (laughs) To which I think I'd add, especially if that name is spoken by the voice of a loved one. Have you ever been in a a new environment, a strange room full of people, nobody that you know? You're feeling alone, anxious, a, a, a little uncertain. And then above the din of the sound in that room, you hear your name coming to you clearly. And it's not just your name, but it's it's from the voice of someone you recognize, a loved one, a parent, a spouse, a child, a friend. And what happens to your heart? Well, first it kind of eases a bit. The anxiety goes down, but then it races and it beats faster as hope is renewed. You're not alone. Someone who knows and loves you is there with you and joy is restored and you can't help but having a smile spread across your face. It took but one word in our text from Jesus. For Mary's life to change. I don't think I can picture a more tender moment in all of Scripture for the love and recognition that would have been there for Mary as she heard from her master's lips her own name, Mary, and all that that meant. In hearing her name from Jesus, for Mary... There's recognition, recognition that he's not dead, he's alive. (laughs) Recognition that Jesus truly is who he said he was. Recognition that Jesus will do what he says he's going to do. And recognition that for her now, her hope is sure and certain when placed in the person and promise Of Christ Jesus. That day, out in front of that empty tomb, when hearing her name from her master, everything changed for Mary. Jesus spoke her name, and something within her came back to life, and that was hope. He spoke her name, and she caught her breath because instantly she knew that it was Jesus and that he was not dead, he was risen, just as he said he would. And friends, that is what you have in Easter as well. That's the hope you have because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is broken out from the tomb, he's no longer dead where he died for your sins, but now as God, he's declared as king of all and your savior who bore your sins. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your death is not the end. Just as it was not for Jesus, so too for you in Christ, your death is not the end. 
because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your hope is sure and certain. When Jesus Christ came back to life, he brought hope to the hopeless. And it wasn't just to Mary, even back then. It was hope given to Peter, who had painfully denied him. It was hope to the disciples who had fled and abandoned him. It was hope to Mary, his mother, whose heart had been pierced as she had watched her son die. It was even to the thief who died next to Jesus on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He brings hope then and he brings hope today. If you take only one thing home from this message today, let it be this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that hope for you is never lost. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means for you, your hope is never lost. When we experience Easter, when we realize what happened to Jesus, just as for Jesus' disciples then, so too for you today, it changes everything. This Easter, a wonderful culmination in the narrative of Christ, but not the end. It's a new beginning. And just as for you in Christ, death and sin is not the end. It's defeated. And his, in his resurrection, there's a new beginning for you. For today and for tomorrow. When Jesus rose again, he made a way for us to live abundantly now and forever with him when he comes again or when we pass and meet him. And on that day when he called Mary by name, her life was transformed and she went from being hopeless to being hope-filled, full of hope. And dearly beloved in Christ, Jesus also calls you by your name. Do you recognize his voice? Have you heard his word of promise to you? Specifically to you, for you. In Isaiah 43 verse 1, God says this to his people Israel and he says it to you, his people today. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, he who knows you, fill in your name. Here's what God says to you. Fear not. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And I bet there are people here, some of you this morning, that need to hear and know this. That God has called you by name. And you are His. You are His. And you know, it's not only that God knows your name and that you are His, but it's all that He has is yours. God knows your name. Do you know His? Yahweh, Emmanuel, God with us, God with you. And God has called out to you by name. And He now invites you to call out to Him His name. And do you know what happens to all who call upon the name of the Lord? Here's what the Bible says is this promise from Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So dear friends, just as Jesus called Mary by name, he so also calls you by your name. Hear his voice. Know and receive his promises to you and believe them. And in the resurrected Christ, your hope will be restored.
and you are saved. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we bow before you. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Spirit of God, work in us to hear your voice and to believe your promises to us that we might be saved. Restore hope, living God, to those who are struggling with hopelessness now. And for all of us, may we look to you each day of our life until we see you, the resurrected Jesus, face to face. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.